Bandwidth for Changelog is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com and we're hosted on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash Changelog. This episode of The Changelog is brought to you by our friends at Sentry. They show you everything you need to know to find and fix errors in your applications. Don't rely on your customers to report your errors. That's not the way you do it. Use Sentry. You can start tracking your errors today for free. They support React, Angular, Ember, Vue, Backbone, Node frameworks like Express and Koa, and many, many other languages. That's just JavaScript I mentioned. View actual code and stack traces, including support for source maps. You can even prompt your users for feedback when front end errors happen, so you can compare their experience to the actual data. At the changelaw.com slash sentry, start tracking your errors today for free. No credit cards required. Once again, changelaw.com slash sentry. Tell them Adam from the changelaw sent you, and now onto the show. You're listening to The Changelog, a podcast featuring the hackers, leaders, and innovators of open source. I'm Adam Stokowiak, editor-in-chief of Changelog. Next up in our mini-series from the Expo Hall floor VozCon, we talk with Dustin Kirkland, head of Ubuntu product and strategy. We talked about Bash on Windows Server, the death of Ubuntu Phone, Snaps and SnapD, and a ton of other fun stuff around the Ubuntu ecosystem. Special thanks to our friends at O'Reilly for inviting us to OzCon. It was a blast being there. And now on to the show. All right, we're here with Dustin Kirkland. We're talking about Ubuntu. Dustin, you have a PSA for the entire Ubuntu. Well, for 8 million Ubuntu people out there. That's right, Jared. Tell us us what it is. Yeah, so just yesterday, 8.3 million Ubuntu 1204, which was the precise Pangolin release of Ubuntu. Precise Pangolin? Pangolin. Not penguin. penguin. Not penguin. Why not penguin? Pangolin. Because, you know... We, that's too typical. Yeah, yeah. That's too easy to get. It's a little weird. Thing. Yeah. Keep it weird. Not a so a thing. pangolin. A pangolin. Look okay. it up. It's a pretty cool little little animal. Rolls up into a to a ball. Like an armadillo. It, it, it's a lot like an armadillo. Here in Texas, we'd call that an armadillo. <laughs> okay. So, 1204 LTS. We released in April of 2012, five years ago. It just end of life on April 28th. 2017, so two weeks ago, okay. basically. But people uh, are still running it. We uh, eight and a half million machines checked in at security.ubuntu.com and said, "Hey, give me my updates." And updates are no longer available for 1204 in the normal archive. So you've got two options. Number one, please, please, please upgrade your 1204 systems to 1404 or 1604. We've got two newer LTSs out there. You can upgrade your desktops. You can upgrade your servers. It's just a, it's a real simple process, automated process. If you can't upgrade, we do have an extended security maintenance product from Canonical where we will provide those security updates for another two years. Yeah. Uh, so come talk to us and we're happy to help if you can't upgrade. But by all means, upgrade if you can. We need to get the 1204 machines, their security updates. Right. Because right, right now they're just out there on the internet. They're vulnerable, man. Uh, totally. Yeah. yeah. Don't use those on do uh, public public Wi-Fi at the coffee shop or uh, hooked up to your cable provider without a firewall. All right. All right. So there's that. PSA done. We done. got that covered. What's next? Done. What's next? The last time we had Dustin on, okay. June 2016, Ubuntu everywhere. That's right. Now we're talking about Ubuntu. Mostly everywhere. It's already everywhere, but we're <laughs> we're scaling back the, the vision a little bit. It's a little different. Refocus. Tell Refocus. us about this this shift uh, in your guys' sure. vision. So I think the biggest and most obvious change is uh, we're mourning the, the death of the Ubuntu phone. So the Ubuntu phone was a pretty awesome experiment uh, that we ran for almost five years now. Uh, but the Ubuntu phone project is now no more. It's no more. However, there is some amazing research and development that went into creating an Ubuntu-based operating system that could run on mobile devices. And in doing so, we now have an OS that we can update transactionally, atomically. We also have a new really? packaging format. That's cool. Yeah, we also have a new packaging format that looks and feels a lot more like packages look and feel like on phones. So all of that work has folded into the Ubuntu on IoT devices effort. So okay. the phone's done, Android, iOS, that's what we're that's what we're stuck with for the rest right. of uh, so it's the not rest be of on the phones, decade. But mm. it's still gonna be on IoT devices. IoT devices, absolutely. There's a there's a, a little booth over here, uh, an Ubuntu booth uh, showing off um, Mycroft. 
which is an open source uh, digital assistant or artificial assistant. It's okay. like an Alexa or a Google Home, except it's built on top of a Raspberry Pi. It's running Ubuntu. It has its own voice recognition software and its own back end that solves problems for you. Uh, that's one of many types of devices that Ubuntu, you'll find the, uh, the Ubuntu IoT story on. Drones, printers, uh, all sorts of you know neat devices. So the phone lives on in a in a in in IoT devices. Let's okay, see. this the ghost of the mobile phone is in IoT devices. Mycroft, I had to look it up. That was Sherlock Holmes's brother. Yes. Uh, when you said that, I thought that sounds like a thing I know about. Yeah. Uh, good name there. Mycroft, Mycroft AI. AI. Yep. Yeah. Check that out. Open source stuff. Okay. So, shift in strategy. Uh, lots of alert things learned. Hey, it takes guts to, to to kill your baby, as I tell Adam. He well, hates that analogy, but yeah. sometimes you gotta kill your babies. <laughs> sometimes you gotta kill your babies. <laughs> it it does take guts because you know you were saying everywhere phone it means everywhere, and I guess the next best thing would be IoT devices, right? Because that kind of is what, to some degree, what a mobile phone is, but not really. It's a it's an emerging it's market thing. for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you guys are geeks. I bet well, you have all sorts of devices around your house. I uh, I challenge you a lot to more devices than phones. M a lot more devices than phones. That's right. And some devices have probably been around for a few years, right. and they're not getting updates. If no. you if you want to have some fun, go home, open up a Linux terminal, and sudo nmap dash dash fingerprint os your entire network. And nmap will do will will run a, a series of heuristics and try to guess the operating system and kernel that's running on all of those devices. And you're going to find a whole bunch of unmaintained Linux 2.4, Linux 2.6, 10, 15 year old kernels on devices you didn't even know was running an operating system, much less the Linux based operating system. Okay, right. that's the problem we're trying to solve with Ubuntu Core. Ubuntu Core being our OS for embedded devices. It, they're they're going to get updates the same way Ubuntu gets updates. Uh, transactionally, safely, and without you even needing to, to know or worry about that. So certainly a more secure IoT device world. Absolutely. Which is a huge issue. It, absolutely. It's one of the biggest issues with I mean, IoT is... It's understating it, of course, but I mean, you got baby monitors being oh, yeah. taken over. You got, what else, garage doors. Right. You got micro... Who's using an right. IoT microwave out there? What, wow. what for? You know... Who knows? But it's happening. I guarantee it. You know, there, there's there's Secure something. That I, thing. It's, it, exactly. It's all about the security. You know what the uh, S in IoT stands for, right? There is Tell no me. S. Security. Security. You're exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> there is. I was like IoT. Where's I mean, the it's S? early in the morning. You know, where's where's the, the S? In there? Yeah, 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 he's trying to exactly. slip them by us. I was like, he's sneaky. He's sneaky. He, I walked right into his plan. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, can we maybe rewind and say why you were even going after the phone? Was it simply this mission of everywhere, or, or was there a real reason? Uh, you know, we had some early partners on it. Uh, we're all just free software. We're here at OzCon, uh, and right. you you won't find more free software. Truly. GPL free software anywhere in the world than yeah. in the canonical and Ubuntu family of of software. GPL and AGPL are our default licenses. We really default to to a free software world. Uh, and you know we, we were running a lot of Android and a lot of uh, iOS devices on on our on our persons on our tablets. Um, but we just you know we've got this innate desire to run open source and truly free software that we can in inspect, that we can uh, update, that we can fix. And I mean that was that was the real goal of the phone. You know, we, we ran an unsuccessful Indiegogo campaign to re raise thirty two million dollars to build our own hardware and OS. Uh, we raised half of that and set That's the a lot record of money, man. for That's well, a lot we of set money. the record for the most committed. There was there was over sixteen million. We got over halfway there to the commit, um, but we gave it all back when we when we didn't didn't reach the. It's a wise goal. move. It's like the Nugs guy. You guys see the Nugs guy? He got his he got his That's nuggets. Right, I did. <laughs> For, what was it, four mil that? three million retweets or something? He, he set the record for the most retweets. So do you know the story, Adam? No, I'm, tell right, me. So uh, some some guy tweeted about... High school kid, I think. Yeah, high school kid tweets at Wendy's. Uh, what's it going to take to get free nuggets? For How many year? retweets is it going to take for me to get free nuggets for, for a, year? a year? And they said 18 million. And what? He said, and he said, consider it done. He Cons took a picture of that conversation, tweeted it, and then it just went crazy. And he set the record. He beat Ellen from the Oscars a few years back. Wow, that, was a, that was a big photo. Most yeah. retweets in history, 3.5 million, something like that. Nowhere yeah. near the 18 million. Yeah. But Wendy's gave him the they nuggets. They made good on it. Yeah, because, valiant effort. Yeah, because nice. he set the record. You know, so it's kind of like that. Only you guys had to give. I hope this guy doesn't have to give the nuggets back later. Yeah, that's going to be gross. 
<laughs> but you guys give the money back, so that's yeah. Well, you know, we, right we went on we went on to create the operating system. We put it on three or four devices: a couple of Meizu devices, a couple of BQ phones. Um, I ran it on a Nexus, on a Google Nexus for for a few years. Um, it was it was really some beautiful technology. I'm I'm delighted to see that 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 the the children of that technology yeah. lives on in the IoT space. Right. Uh, and I think that's even more important. That that's a space where. Uh, where I think open source and free software is extremely important. You're going to want to know what software is running on your on your router, on your voice over IP, your smartphone, or your uh, you know your voice over IP phone, yeah. all those devices, your refrigerator, your right. smart especially when microwave. you get to the things that are uh, vital for life, you know, medical things, right. safety things, right? Yeah. Well, I'm, yes, absolutely. Uh, safety critical. I was I was thinking more from a security and privacy perspective, uh, but yeah, absolutely. The life the life critical stuff as well. Yeah, for sure. If if you had been successful though, would it have been a Apple iOS, Google Android, canonical Ubuntu world? Is that what just kind of curious if that's what you were trying to do or was it simply open source, secure Linux? Well, the, and the real vision the real vision was always convergence. It's when this laptop here that you're that you're looking at and your phone merge into one thing. So that when your phone is nearby or touching or docked in this, that's providing the the CPU memory, right. uh, RAM, the disk, the storage, the network, the network connectivity for this larger format shell that you're in, and a bigger screen, easier keyboard to type on. But when you take that phone o away, it's got everything that you need on it to then be just as productive on that. So we were going for convergence, and you know, over the course of a couple of years, we showed um, we showed that that vision. Yeah. It's just. That's, it's really hard to do when you don't control the, the hardware the hardware platform and when you're the the third entrant in a in an already crowded yeah. crowded market. Well, even even a company with the size and cloud of Microsoft couldn't get their mobile. Yeah, I mean that's true. They wanted to be the third runner and yep, and that's they, true. They didn't even hold on. So no, it was, there's, it, was there's, a, it was an uphill battle. There was a lot of us, yeah. you know, fighting for third place. BlackBerry. I mean, remember uh, ten years ago, BlackBerry would have been the the the, the clear yeah leader in that. Yeah, I heard they're coming back. They have something new out recently. Good for them. <laughs> I, I don't know why. Good, good for Rim. <laughs> yeah, they're always absolutely. yeah. Rim is always trying to do Research something. Research in motion. So. You mentioned some things extracted from this effort. What are those open source? Where are they at? Mm. You know, can people tap into those? Give us a take wheel on that. Yeah, absolutely. So the yes, open source. Yes, absolutely. There, there are two real key pieces that came out of the phone that now is the the basis for Ubuntu as an embedded system. One is Ubuntu Core. Ubuntu Core is an Ubuntu operating system that, as I was telling Jared just a minute ago, is put together in a way that we can do in place atomic transactional upgrades. So you download a, an image, a copy of the OS that you're going to upgrade to, that gets installed into a, a second location. Essentially, it's a squash FS, it's a, a special file system. Yeah. Um, and then when you reboot, you reboot into that new squash FS, that new image. And if everything goes okay, you pass your system checks, your burn-in checks, we clear the flag, which says this is a good boot, and then the next download can, can come down um, and, and will be the next upgrade. If you need to roll back, you can just switch back, reboot and reboot, re reboot back into the previous squash FS. So Very the first cool. half of it is Ubuntu Core. Quick it's, question. Yep. Why can't we just have that for all of our computers? We're getting there. Because I'm still afraid of upgrading. I, right. you, I would love to have... For servers, for laptops. That's so. That's a great question. So we're we're getting there, okay. especially on the server space. So are you familiar with uh, Kubernetes containers? Yeah. So Ubuntu Core we can also use as a server operating system. Um, you have to think about that OS a bit differently. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a mind meld when you get into this. When you get into your root file system being read only, you cannot modify files in the root file system. That's really a different way of interacting mm. with the Linux Unix system. So we, we can get there. We can run Ubuntu Core on a desktop, but mm -hmm. your desktop's going to feel much more like a kiosk, at least in the near term. Okay. Now that's okay, and that's actually what you want in some server applications, yeah. where what you're doing is in interesting inside of a container, maybe a Docker container, maybe a LexD machine container. Right. Uh, but we are using Ubuntu Core in clouds, uh, so in virtual machines and in physical machines, to provide the same benefits that you want out of an OS for an embedded system, but for a server that you don't want to be afraid of upgrading. You want in-place upgrades, uh, and we can do that safely with Ubuntu Core and applications running essentially as, as, as containers. Okay. Now, applications are the second piece of 
uh, the, the fruits of the Ubuntu phone labor that now fits into our entire strategy across the board. It's a new packaging format for Ubuntu called Snaps, Snap Packaging. It comes from Click Packaging. Click was the packaging format for the, for the phone. Uh, that's evolved actually into a packaging format that's now generally useful. So more than just, uh, Click was good for, uh, for packaging the, the, the Facebook app or the, the, the calendar app for the Ubuntu phone. Snaps are much more general purpose and we can use those to package any service or application. So it can be GUI apps for a, an Ubuntu desktop or, or tablet. Um, it can also be uh, server apps. It can be uh, databases like etcd. It can be uh, web servers, uh, Apache or Nginx. Uh, and it's a fantastic modern take on packaging. So and, is that effectively a re like a, a file structure reorganization to, uh, where, uh, to where everything like sandbox inside of an app folder instead of spread across the file system? That's, is there, that's is there more it. to it than that? Yeah, that's part of it, and that's exactly where it starts. Is, yeah. uh, every snap carries with it all the files that it needs to run. Uh, which has been a a pain in the Debian and the RPM world, frankly. I'll say, isn't shared libraries like isn't that good? Yes, it's good <laughs> to an extent. Or we thought it was good it, for a long time. Well, it, it's it's good for what it is. Yeah. It's not good for what it's not. And there's a tautology for you. So well, thank you. Uh, uh, disagree with that one. I dare you. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, uh, this man speaks truth. Yeah. No, there, there are shared libraries, which are part of that base Ubuntu core image. So that yeah. operating system image... So if they're available already, yes. you, can, you can link to them. Yes, and there are some that you want to come from the operating system, you know? Okay. Um, the the low-level stuff, the glibc, the SSL, the, 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 the standard libraries. But having gotten to know many thousands of developers over the years, developers want to build with the tools they want to build with, want to ship with the libraries that they want to ship with, and some languages have that natively built in. Java, for instance, as much as you either love or hate Java, if you understand how Java works, your jar file contains all of the code that you need to run, and it's part of its portability. Right. And you might have down-level versions of compression or, or, or some, some library like that, but you don't care because that's the way your app was supposed to run. The other way of doing it is the opposite of shared libraries, which is static comp compilation, which is now, again, in vogue. If you yeah. go and do anything in the Golang world, Golang is going to want to compile static. Single binary, yeah. So that, that, that's showing a shift in the way applications are being developed, and fundamentally, snaps are a packaging format that allows that. Debs and RPMs don't allow that. Right. It's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do that in Debs and RPMs. And so we've created a packaging format that's modern and addresses that. Is this moving you guys further away from Debian in terms of you know the this like the likeness of the two distributions? I don't think so. No, because the the underlying there's a there's a there's one binary that has to be running on the system to use snaps and it's, it's SnapD. It's the daemon that is. Uh, required to to host and run. It's a lightweight little Golang service, essentially. But we've ported that SnapD to Debian. It's available in Debian, in Fedora, in CentOS, in SUSE, in Arch, in Gentoo. You can use Snaps anywhere, in fact. In fact, the same Snap can run anywhere, um, as long as you have a, a SnapD that's running on that system. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So no, I, I don't. I don't think it moves us further from Debian. It's it's. Uh, Debs aren't going away, but new software we're rapidly migrating toward using the Snap packaging format. So, cool. for instance, Kubernetes is a big, complicated bit of software, um, also written in Golang. Uh, we package Kubernetes as a Snap and deploy it as a Snap. When we come back from the break, we're going to talk about Bash on Ubuntu on Windows, specifically Bash on Ubuntu on Windows Server, which was announced recently at Microsoft Build Conference. We asked questions like, why is Microsoft behind this move? What can we expect from Windows Server? But more importantly, who is asking for this and why? Stick around. This episode is brought to you by TopTal. TopTal is the best way to hire freelance talent to scale your team, work with top freelance software developers, designers, and finance experts from all over the world. Or if you're a developer, designer, or finance expert looking to freelance with top companies like JP Morgan, Airbnb, or Pfizer, head to TopTal.com to learn more. That's T-O-P-T-A-L.com. Tell them we sent you. For a more personal introduction, email me, adam at changelaw.com. 
This episode of The Change Log is brought to you by GoCD, an open source continuous delivery server from our friends at ThoughtWorks. GoCD lets you model complex workflows, promote trusted artifacts, see how your workflow really works, deploy any version anytime, run and grok your tests, compare builds, take advantage of plugins, and so much more. Check out gocd.io slash changelog to learn more. And now back to the show. Last time we had you on, in fact, the, the reason that we brought you on was the big bash on Windows uh, announcement last year. Yep. And we found out on that show that, you know, uh, Dustin was the, the messenger. Microsoft did a lot of the work, and it was kind of their idea, and uh, Ubuntu or Canonical played along, and that was great. It's very cool. Uh, Microsoft. I think we were a little more involved. Oh, okay. Now I'm giving you not enough credit. <laughs> but, yeah. That was, sure. well, my takeaway was at least they came, they came to you. Yes. And a lot of the work had to be done by them. Yes. Okay. That's right. So I'm backing down that a little bit. Thank you for... But yeah, it, it does. The Windows kernel is still proprietary software that a, a few right. Windows developers in Microsoft have access to. Right. We don't. Yeah. Um, but we, we do do quite a bit of work to, to, to provide the, the Q&A, the automated testing, the, right. the upgrades and the updates of the Ubuntu image into the, the store. Mm -hmm. um, so we've since moved that image from Ubuntu 14.04 to Ubuntu 16.04, okay. uh, which was, uh, in, you know, involved quite a bit of, of testing and QA, a few adjustments. Uh, the Microsoft team has done an amazing job uh, responding to issues in GitHub, fixing uh, things that, that were broken or not quite working right. As you can imagine, things go wrong when you're doing something as, as complicated as, as that. Um, they've also released it out of beta, and it's now generally available in Windows 10 on the desktop. Uh, the big announcement today at Microsoft Build, we're at OSCON in Austin, Texas, at Microsoft Build in San Francisco, Microsoft is announcing uh, that same bash on Ubuntu uh, on Windows experience for the Windows Server, which uh, has has been uh, a frequent request of Windows users. They they like this Bash thing for their desktops, but man, they really want to use this on a server. So now you can imagine, literally Apache running natively on a Windows server. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Uh, it is a little weird. <laughs> it is a little weird. SSH directly on a Windows That's server. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I mean. I think uh, it's a new Microsoft. What are the other <laughs> What are the other advantages? I guess anything anything you what, why not just run a Linux server then if you're going to have everything on you know maybe because you still want your SQL server or something. I yeah that you there's absolutely a time and a place for a full Linux virtual machine and that doesn't go away yeah. when you need a Linux kernel for one reason or another. Maybe you're opinionated about what Linux kernel you need. You need a particular interface or uh, maybe you're, you're custom compiling it or you're tuning it or tweaking it. Um, so yeah, they're, they're, there's absolutely Linux machines running in the millions, Ubuntu machines running in the millions, instances in Azure, in uh, Amazon, yeah. um, in Google Compute. So that doesn't change. I, I don't think that changes at all. If you, if you go over to the booth here, the, Microsoft has a big booth. They have one screen up and it is the, the Bash Ubuntu shell that they're, that Rich is Rich Turner is constantly running demos on, and it's fantastic. I like to lurk in the back as conspicuously as, <laughs> as possible. Uh, and He's wearing an Ubuntu shirt. It's orange. Yeah. You can't miss him. Yeah, you can't lurk. <laughs> no, you, you can't lurk. But Everybody watching watching the questions that come up, and you know, people's heads sort of turn when they see and understand what's going on there. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you to answer your question. It's the fact that it's instant. That when you click on that Ubuntu icon on the Windows desktop. You're in a bash shell immediately. That's cool. Immediately, there's no boot up time. Uh, there's no like unclean processes or services that might start or might not start. Whether you're on a network or on an airplane, you're just you're in a bash shell, and it feels really native, really natural. That's cool. So, what does this do for a server? What does the Ubuntu on, on Windows do for a server? Yes. Good, good question. And I think who asked for it and why? Man, uh, yeah, the lots of people. It sounds uh, like lots of people. Yeah, um, just digging through the the GitHub issues feature requests on the on the Microsoft GitHub site, you'll see this request quite a bit. I think it's the bridge between. I'm doing this on my desktop, and it's cool. Yeah. Um, but I have this server at work, or I have this Windows server, where I want 
I want bash. I want to be able to 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 to, to grep and awk and said through my local Windows file system. You know, um, I think last time I shared the I shared the anecdote about how I had to modify some code on a Windows machine, which I hadn't really used in almost 20 years, and I was struggling my way through Visual Studio. When what I needed to do was replace one word in 21 files, and maybe there's a way to do that in Visual Studio. I don't know how, <laughs> but it occurred to me that wait a minute, I could literally just drop down to a Bash shell, find dot dash files equals pipe said, right. re- rewrite those files, and I'm and you're done. done. And I'm done. That was yeah. awesome. So I think server users want to be able to take advantage of that as well yeah. you know it makes sense that once you get a, like a drink of it on your in one environment and you're like oh this is awesome because i still have all my apps that i like on windows and i got my linux shell which is far superior to what i had previously but when i go to the server that i've been running you know that i have right. already i can't use any of these tools that i've either fallen in love with or have always loved and wanted in windows and now right. i have them right and so I'd love to have those on my server, especially when it comes to automation and the scripting and stuff. Yeah, I think it's the power of apt. The fact that 55,000 binary packages are available in Ubuntu 16.04, one command, one click away. Um, that It's been beautiful to watch Windows users come to terms with the fact that there's a... There's an app store built into Ubuntu. We've never called it an app store. It's, right. it's the it's a package archive, right? right? But it's fundamentally an app store where everything is free and yeah. open source software. It's no pricing. No app to search anything you want, you know, and 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 it's there. So would it be practical then to have a Windows machine, a Windows server, running Apache or Nginx versus Microsoft's? Was it MIS or IS? IS. IIS, that's right. Yes. <laughs> it's practical. <laughs> it's definitely practical. Yes. Why is it practical? I, man, Why wouldn't they just inst- just go with a Linux server? Because maybe case? they already have the Windows server. Yeah, there, there's certainly reasons but, okay, why, so why you, 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 you... There's certainly reasons why you might want to spin up a Hyper-V virtual machine on Windows and run Ubuntu or another OS inside of that to run your services. That'll happen. And there's good reasons to do that. Maybe they're networking reasons or firewall reasons. You know, it's a flat. It's a flat namespace. It's a flat network space. Uh, the, the the shell, the right. Bash shell on the Windows server. It's the same IP address. All the packets that land at the IP address, which is the, that server endpoint. Um, all the ports are are flat. So, it it feels like the two are one, right? And so, from that perspective, that might be what you want. It also might not be what you want. Right. Which you don't. No, they're not forcing on anybody, right? No, uh, I'm. I'm not selling Windows either. Nobody came I, to my door and said, "Hey, you need to run it this way." That's right. You know, they're given options, which is great. Right. No, I'm. I, I'm, I'm not. Just se- because you can doesn't mean you should, or will, or will, but you can. Right. So that's entering beta. <laughs> It'll be in beta for a while. It's at the at the uh, uh, just saw a friend here across the hall. Um, the joy of conferences. There's, yeah, there's, there's, there's friends people everywhere. everywhere. Little friendly even, nod. Little you, friendly nod. There's never even heard pigeons walking around. I know. There's there's pigeons here. It's it's. I don't so understand no, why. No distractions. Yeah. At all. Uh, yeah. None whatsoever. <laughs> um, what were we were talking we? about? <laughs> <laughs> Bash, I actually don't Windows remember. Server. Yeah. I think you were tailing off on that. That's yeah. all right. It's good stuff. So we're, we're enjoying it. For those else? listening, where can they go to find out this? Where do they go to, to find out more? Uh, yeah, so Rich Turner uh, at uh, Microsoft has a blog post that's uh, out today talking about it. Um, uh, this is a uh, it's a new thing. It's it's in beta for Windows Server and will be for a while. That's that's at the Microsoft Does that mean you can discretion. sign up for the beta? Or yeah, I'm, I'm sure It's available to download for anybody? I, I don't even know. You don't even know? No. Okay. But I'm sure, yes. Information is still pending, but... It's, it's announcements out there. being made today. Blog post going in out. the keynote. There's gotcha. a demo. Watch it online. Uh, Catch up. Yeah, you guys have like a list of awesome links at the end of the podcast yes. anyway. So we'll we'll get you that we'll one. Link we'll link up in the show notes for sure. For sure. I love that. By the way, those yeah. are those are pretty awesome. It's it's appropriate in that it's this is the change log. You right. have you know here's the log of good, stuff. Good change log. We gotta, we gotta log the, the stuff. <laughs> That's right. We no. actually have a bot that logs. Call him Logbot. 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 All right. Nobody knows about Logbot. Nope. What's now Logbot? they do. Now Announcing they do. Logbot. <laughs> Announcing Logbot. Vaporware right coming to a <laughs> app store not near you. Yeah. That's right. That's right. It's awesome. a figment of our imagination that we talk about. It's a desire, a dream. <laughs> <laughs> vaporware. 
Good. And I heard, I heard you were going to start working on an Alexa skill for a change well, log, right? As soon as uh, you get back to your house, you're going to start. I'm going to start working for you. Yeah, yeah. Alexa. Alexa skill. Ask change log for episode 192 featuring Dustin Kirkland. <laughs> I don't know if that's the right number. No, you got it wrong, but uh, Alexa would correct you, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, she, she will. She knows I think you mean. Yeah, did you mean episode one? <laughs> I don't know what it is. What's I, the episode number, Jared? 207. 207. In I the think right you ballpark. mean episode 207. Mm. Would you like me to play that for you? Yes, Alexa. Yes. Set volume to zero. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't actually want to listen to myself. Play at 1.25x. <laughs> Uh, Dust, anything else before we let you go? Uh, no, you guys are great, man. Thanks. Thanks for coming in and thanks for talking with us, man. It's a lot, a lot of fun. You bet. You bet. All right, thank you for tuning in to the Change Log. We love talking to people like Dustin who make the open source community what it is, makes it thrive. If you enjoyed this show, share it with a friend or two. Thanks to our sponsors, Century, TopTal, and GoCD. Also, thanks to Fastly, our bandwidth partner. Head to Fastly.com to learn more. We host everything we do on Linode servers. Head to Linode.com slash changelog. Check them out. Support the show. The Changelog is hosted by myself, Adam Stachowiak, and Jared Santo. We're edited by Jonathan Youngblood. And the awesome music you've been hearing is produced by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. You can find more episodes just like this at changelaw.com or by subscribing wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.